server functions, which are an incredibly popular feature of today's cutting edge full stack frameworks, don't actually exist in the web platform. Let's get into it. So let's start off with what is a server function? And to do that, we'll show it off by example. So in this case, add numbers is a server function. It's got use server on it. And when you invoke add numbers, you actually invoke it on the client, but it actually runs on the server, therefore a server function. Now this is the Next.js app router version of a server function. I'm gonna show you four in this video. Another is from Tanstack start, as well as solid start, as well as quick. And that's important because there's subtle differences in the implementation of them that you should know about because at the end of the day, this video isn't an anti-server function video. I actually like server functions a lot. It's a video about helping you understand how server functions work and when you should choose to use them in your application. All right, let's see this add number of server function in action. So I've got my Next.js page. We'll go and say we want 10 plus 20 and we'll hit add and we get a result of 30. So clearly we're getting a good add there. Now let's go take a look at the network panel and we can try again. And we can see that we get a request to localhost to invoke that function. But maybe you're not convinced. Maybe you're like, come on, add. That can be run on the client, obviously. Well, let's do something that could only be run on the server. For example, getting the files from the current directory. We'll create a new server function called get files to do that. Now to invoke that on Next.js at least, we need a component. So we'll call that files list.tsx. It'll take that get files server function as a function prop. And then in that use effect, it'll actually invoke get files. And then finally down the bottom, we'll put in an ordered list of all those files. All right. Now we'll bring that in here. We'll import that component, hit save. And now when I refresh the page, we can see over on the side here, we get the files from the current working directory where Next.js is running. And that's not something that the browser in its sandbox could have access to. So that could only happen on the server. So now we know about what server functions are. Let's talk about how they're actually implemented. Now, what the server function is doing is calling the server. So what are our options to call a server? Well, first and foremost, fetch. We've all used this in the past. This is how we make a lot of requests to the server. So that's one option. There is the older cousin of fetch XML HTTP request. Some folks, including like, I think HTMX still use that. There was WebSockets. Those are very cool bi-directional pipes between the client and the server that run in real time. There are server sent events that are literally just that, events sent from the server in a one-way direction. Then there's posting a form to the server. Now, form actions in this case are often mistaken for server functions. Form actions are very specific responses to form posts to the server, they have a very specific input and output. They are not server functions. There's the old standby of creating an element on the page, usually like a script tag or an image that has a source. That's a way to communicate with the server. And then finally, there's a new beacon API. The commonality among all these is that they are not server functions. In fact, there is no support for server functions in the web platform. That's a really important distinction to make because we often think of frameworks as simply wrapping features of the web platform. But in this case, there is no server function in the web platform itself. Server functions are a new framework feature created by the framework authors. In fact, I think you could rightly say that server functions are a form of syntactic sugar. Now that's not necessarily a bad, so what is syntactic sugar? Well, syntactic sugar is a way of taking something that we do really often and making it just easier and less error prone. So how does this actually happen? Well, let's start with our JavaScript or TypeScript application code. Now that goes into a bundler. And the bundler in turn creates two different bundles. One is for the server that gets run on the server and another is for the client and that gets run on the client. So why does it do this? Why are there two different bundles? Well, it's important to understand what code goes where. For example, UI code in our case with isomorphic frameworks like Quick, like Solid, like React, the UI code actually goes into both bundles because when you do a server-side render request, the server actually renders the UI code in memory on the server, creates the HTML pay payload, and sends that over to the client. So it needs all of the UI code. Now, when a server has API code, that is only in the server bundle. That goes for a server function server code as well. So that is the body of the server function goes into the server bundle. 
And then the server function client code goes into the client. So let's actually get into this in a bit more detail. So we'll take our app code, which in this case is that get file server function that we created before, give that to the bundler, and the bundler then creates an API endpoint. Now this is pseudocode. This isn't exactly like you get in any of these frameworks, but the idea is you'd have a get handler on a particular API route, and then it would go and run that reader and return those files. And then the bundler would also create the corresponding client code that would make the fetch to that endpoint. But from the developer's perspective, they're just calling get files. Is it on the back end? Is it on the front end? Who cares? It's just an asynchronous request to get files. All of the complexity is handled by the bundler. And the idea of a server function is just that syntactic sugar that's hiding that complexity from us. Let's go and take a look at this in action. And this time we'll take a look at it on Tanstack start. So let's bring up the network panel as well as our console. And let's do an add. So we do an add here. And we can see that the type of request here is a fetch. We can actually dig into what the request is. So this is a post to a URL. We don't actually have any control over what that URL is. We do, however, in the case of Tansac Start, have the ability to specify what we want to use in terms of the method of the request. So here we're saying that when we create our server function, we want it to use a method of post. This ability to specify that HTTP method is actually a uniquely distinguishing feature of Tansac Start. Next.js, on the other hand, only allows you to do posts. Now the payload here is actually JSON. You can see it pretty easy. You can have your data and that maps to the input fields. And then the response is pretty easy JSON. Now in order to kind of reinforce this a little bit, let's go and override fetch. So we're gonna replace that global fetch function with just an invocation of debugger, which is gonna put us into the debugger. Now let's add again and boom, we're in the debugger. Now let's go and take a look at our call stack. And if you were to look at the call stack, so here's our fetch. Here's our click handler, and look, we're just calling add numbers, and it's magic, right? Well, actually, let's get into the details a little bit. So I enable show ignored listed frames. You can actually go in here and we can see what's actually happening. So we get the on click, it goes through some middleware stuff within Tansac Start, and eventually gets to server function fetcher. So now we see this server function fetcher function, which all the way down here calls handler, which in our case is fetch. That's why our debugger got hit and it's formatting the request to the client. So that's exactly what happens. The client bundle has this server function fetcher, which in turn calls fetch, which in turn calls a generated API endpoint on our server. So this is actually really good, right? I mean, syntactic sugar is really helping us in this case. We can see that we're getting good JSON payloads between the client and the server. I mean, why not use server functions for everything? In fact, that's a question that I get asked almost every single time I bring up server functions, which is actually why I'm doing this video. So let's talk about the trade-offs of server functions. So the first trade-off of server functions is that you don't control the URL. The framework does. The framework gets to decide what that URL is. And in some cases, it decides both the URL as well as the HTTP method. So let's start off a nice big table of features by starting off with the server functions and HTTP URL. Well, in this case, it's locked. We don't get to control that. That is not something that we get to specify in the code. HTTP method, in the case of Tanstack start, we get to define that. But in the case of other frameworks, we don't get to define that. Input format, we don't control that. And is it a standard? Well, sometimes it's not even JSON. In fact, there are some responses from Tanstack start, like a stream that are supported by server functions. So you can do that, but they don't return JSON. In fact, let's go back and take a look at next and solid and quick and see what they take as inputs and outputs to their server functions. We'll start off with next.js where we left off. So here a server function is a post to the base endpoint of our local host. Interesting. The, the payload in this case is JSON and it's an array where each array are the arguments to the function. Pretty easy. Well, let's take a look at the response. Well, the response is I think flight data. So that's not JSON. So here's our quick example with exactly the same thing. Let's hit add. Now we get a request again to the base endpoint of 5173 in this case, which is where the server is running for a Q func of type post. Let's take a look at the payload. Payload is JSON, but I'm not exactly sure what's what in there. And the response is actually of type uh, application quick JSON, which Chrome doesn't really know what to do with. So we get this JSON blob here that quick then decodes into the result. 
Finally, let's take a look at solid start, not to be confused with Tanstack start for solid. All right, let's fix the numbers here and then add. So it's a request a server with a post. Don't get to decide that. The payload is a type of JSON, though I'm not quite sure. I guess S20 and 10, there's our data. And the response is text JavaScript, which is actually super JSON in this case. All right, so back into our chart, we can see that both the input and output formats of all of these server functions are locked. We can't get to decide what is going in or going out or how to format it. And it's not always or even often JSON. So we don't use server functions. Well, what's the alternative? Well, one alternative is just to have API endpoints, and then we get to decide on everything when it comes to the API endpoints, including the URL, the method, the input formats, output formats, and all of that. Another option is to use something like trpc. In that case, we get to decide the prefix for the URL, for example, slash trpc or slash api slash trpc, but everything after that prefix is maintained and controlled by trpc. The HTTP method, if it's a query, is a get, if it's a mutation, it's a post. The input and output formats are locked to JSON RPC. And then, of course, another incredibly popular alternative is GraphQL. In this case, you do get to decide the URL of your GraphQL server, as well as the HTTP method. You can actually use GraphQL on post or on get, if you want to use that, although I wouldn't recommend it. The input format is locked to GraphQL, and the output format is locked to JSON. None of these things are inherently bad. They're simply trade-offs, but there is something that's really important that distinguishes the left-hand side of the column, which is that neither server functions nor API endpoints are a standard, and the right side of the column, which are cross-platform, cross-language standards. So when I think about when to use server functions and when not, it's a pretty simple flowchart. The most important question that I have when it comes to whether or not to use server functions is, does your API have external clients? Do you have a mobile client? Do you have customers that want to talk to your API and get data from your API as opposed to your UI? And if the case is yes, then you should use a standards-based API. GraphQL, TRPC, there's lots of them. Then if you, but if you don't, then server functions or your own custom APIs are fine. Or you could use a standard too. That's fine as well. The only other question for me when it comes to server functions is whether or not the server function standard that you are on can support things that you need. For example, does it support setting the HTTP method? If you have a requirement for caching, that's a big deal. Another thing is, does it actually support the input formats and output formats that you want from that server function? That's not always the case. All right, well, I hope this helps you get a lot more insight in how server functions work as well as when you should use them. If you have any questions or comments, please put that in the comment section right down below. In the meantime, if you like this video, hit that like button. If you really like the video, hit the subscribe button and click on that bell and be notified the next time a new blue collar coder comes out.